Uh, well, welcome everybody uh, to this session on land use. Welcome those of you who are here, uh, those of you who are online. Um, I'm really thrilled uh, to be chairing this session because this is a topic whose hour has at last come. Uh, Paul here has been working on it for about 40 years, uh, as he said just now, of failure, and he's now achieved success because this is now a big issue as I'm sure you all know, with both the Conservative Party, the government interested, and the opposition interested, never have we gone into a general election with planning as one of the central issues. So we've got this wonderful lineup uh, to discuss it. First, we have Paul Cheshire, Professor of Economic Geography at the LSE. Um, he has been the great, uh, bold, undaunted voice of reason on this subject for so many years, uh, the Green Belt and all of that that we're going to discuss. Um, and now at last, uh, he's got people to listen. Next we have uh, Kate Barker, Dame Kate. Uh, Kate is one of our most distinguished economists in public life in Britain. Uh, she was three times, I think she's the only person who's been three times a member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the uh, Bank of England and she managed at the same time to lead two reviews on this subject, uh, one on housing uh, and one on land, land use. So it's wonderful to have her here. Then we have Stephen Aldrich. Um, he uh, is a, a really wonderful uh, civil servant who started in the Treasury Cabinet Office, commissioned many good things, including <laughs> some of mental health even. Um, he now has been for many years the uh, chief economist at the department, now called uh, Leveling Up, but it includes, of course, housing, um, where he has been a really wonderful uh, advocate for uh, a reasoned and rational approach uh, to problems of housing land use. He's also a great defender of well-being, which is why I love him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, we have Simon Wilson, Lord Wilson. Uh, he is the chief executive of one of our favourite stores that I'm sure we've all been to next. Uh, and he's also a member of the House of Lords on the Conservative bench. So welcome to all of them. Um, they are going to talk for t precisely 12 minutes each. I think they've all been practicing. Um, and um, I need to make some practical uh, announcements also. For Twitter users, the hashtag is, I think it's called hash that time, yes, hash LSE planning. Uh, the event is being recorded and mm -hmm. will hopefully be made available in the podcast, uh, provided there are no technical difficulties. Um, as usual, sorry, I'm not speaking from the mic, am I? Um, <laughs> as usual, there'll be a chance uh, for you to get uh, your questions later um, and for the online audience, so be thinking about that and please uh, be submitting your questions via the Q&A feature at the top left of your screen. Um, the questions should be submitted to me and please include your name and affiliation. And we're especially keen to hear from students and alumni. So, uh, with no more from me, uh, let's start with the most. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Uh, Stephen, see what happens when I press a button. Nothing, wrong thing, wrong button. There we go. Right button. So just to summarise, thank you very much for that introduction. It's very nice to be here and it's very good to be talking about this subject, which I've been doing a lot in the last uh, few months and uh, Stephen's already heard quite a lot of this, I think, quite recently. Uh, so what is central is the growing housing affordability crisis. So access to housing is out of reach, but it's not just that. It has serious welfare implications. It has adverse distributional impacts and it generates highly perverse incentives. Problem, underlying problem, is supply restriction, primarily via our planning system, though we managed to do it in other ways too. 
So the real costs of housing have been going up over two generations, and the quality has been going down. Now, what I want to urge on my economic economist colleagues, including CP, is that this is a problem we should be taking very seriously, not just as housing in, in the housing context, but because of its damaging wider economic impacts. Indirectly, it impedes labour mobility and reduces agglomeration economies and the productivity of the UK economy, but it directly by its controls on location for commercial uses and by its restrictions on the supply of office buildings increases the cost of commercial space which feeds straight through to lost productivity. And I'm just going to talk about two improvements that uh, I've been thinking about for some time. One is a strategic repurposing of the green belts to create more publicly accessible open space and to improve the environmental impact both of green belts and of housing development by releasing land near commuter stations for housing. And the second is to move to a rules-based planning system, which in fact the Conservatives, to do them credit, tried to do last uh, in August 2020, but it got completely abandoned uh, when everyone went apeshit on the back benches of the Tory party after the Chesham announcement by election. So that was lost. So the reality is that house prices have more or less doubled in real terms in every decade since the 1950s. That doesn't just produce homelessness, but it's a major source of inequity between the old and the young. I'm a huge beneficiary, and I'm sure most people on the, on the panel here are huge beneficiaries of the escalation in house prices. But it's extremely damaging for the young, and it damages social cohesion. It generates this, this conflict between the housing haves and the housing have-nots. So those born in the 1950s, 70% owned a house by the time they were age 34. That is now down to 34%. It reduces total GDP by reducing labour mobility to more productive locations. So in the United States, Shai and Moretti, a uh, well-known paper, uh, Puger and Dumaton, have estimated something like a 13.7% loss of total output in the US as a result of restricting mobility to the east and west coasts. However, you think how restrictive we are in this country, no one has done the work in this country, but it's probable that the results, are, the, the implications are significantly greater. Certainly, it reduces the agglomeration economies in places like Cambridge or Oxford or London. And so it increases the supply of labour, of labor, the, the costs of, of labour supply in London and the South East, which results in these foregone losses. And it also has these perverse effects that between 1995 and 2015, for example, land, mainly land, with <coughs> houses on it, increased as a proportion of people's personal assets from 49% to 62%. According to uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, housing, or rather the land under houses, was worth about the same as total GDP for all the period between 1700 and 1960, but is now worth three times as much as annual GDP. Uh, high rate of return on, on, on housing, and that's mainly the land, because whilst house prices have increased five-fold in real terms since 1955, the price for putting, of land for putting houses on has increased 15-fold over the same time, and the result of that is you have smaller houses, you have better, worse design, you have poorer construction, because all the money in house building actually has to go on the land, and it has a direct uh, hit on productivity. For example, very few people, it's a very nerdish interest of mine, there's something called town centre first policies introduced in England in 1996, forcing, particularly retail, to go to traditional high streets and town centres. Now, Christian and I published a paper in 2015 showing that for a big supermarket chain, that had actually had the effect of causing a reduction in total factor productivity of 32%. That's a big hit to a big industry. Uh, and uh, I managed to get hold of some data, similar data for a big clothing retailer, and that actually was worse, a 47% loss of productivity directly as a result of uh, town centre first policies, which uh, other research we've done and others have done shows actually don't produce the, the, out, the, a, the payoff that they were supposed to. Directly reduces employment in town centres, for example, in retail. So this, this slide here is one of my old favourites. Some of you may have seen it before. 
Uh, what it shows is the real price of housing land since 1892 up until the price series was abolished by the coalition government when they came in in May uh, 2010, uh, say 50,000 uh, pounds. And what you can see is that you, know, you can make more land. Mark Twain was wrong. And you could make more land, and we did, because we built railways. First of all, we built suburban railways, then we built the tube system, and then we built roads. So the supply of land as cities grew, grew bigger was quite elastic, and the price of land for houses didn't rise in real terms until the late 1950s. What happened in 1955? The Metropolitan Green Belt was imposed. Now, the Metropolitan Green Belt wasn't imposed in order to generate a wonderful green environment. It's a wonderful, rhetorical, successful political name, but it has nothing to do with green environment at all. Actually, it was imposed by a Tory uh, minister, uh, Duncan Sands, in order to keep potential Labour voters out of the home counties. <laughs> and so it extends from the North Sea, London's Green Belt, extends from the North Sea all the way to the edge of Aylesbury. It's a huge area. But what you can see is that led to a huge increase in the real price of housing, of housing land, times 15%, and it also led to an increase in house prices. But also, of course, because you're restricting supply and making it very inelastic, it increased, in the, volatil increased the volatility. And it's not just that it's, uh, it's an issue of supply and restrictions on la land supply, it's also we have a discretionary system. Having a discretionary system injects uncertainty into the development process, so lo and behold, Countries that have a discretionary planning system, lo and behold, they're all they're former British colonists. We exported our planning system. Lucky people in Canada, they've got a discretionary system, as it is in New Zealand. So all the biggest increases in real house prices are in those countries, including the UK. Uh, you know, places like Germany or Switzerland are really quite sensible. That's over a long period of 50 years. So you know, we have one of, New Zealand is worse, Auckland, all those sheep in New Zealand, Auckland's got a green belt bigger than London's green belt. But there you go. So it, I did a simple calculation that if you look at how many houses we've built in the last 30 years, we've built over 3 million fewer than we built in the previous uh, 30 years. It's supply. Uh, Centre for Cities did a paper earlier this year where they did a more sophisticated attempt to look at how many houses we would have built since 1945 had we behaved like Germany or Holland or, or France. <clears throat> and they calculated that we had a shortfall of about 4.3 million houses that we hadn't built since 1945. And not only that, where we do build houses, we build them where they're least unaffordable. So if you add up all the houses built in Barnsley and Doncaster in the 40 years ending in, 19, uh, in 2018, there were an increase of 23,000 in population, but they managed to build 56,000 houses. On the other hand, Oxford and Cambridge, you had nearly 100,000 increase in population, only built 29,000 houses. So we build far too few houses, and as far as we do build houses, we build them in the wrong place. So two possible suggestions for improving the situation. They're not solutions. They're simply things that could be done at, I think, zero cost and would improve the situation considerably. So green belts, as I said, are not green lungs. The biggest land use in the green belt is intensive agriculture. And intensive agriculture is one of the least environmentally friendly uh, activities that we have in the, in, mo in the modern world. And British agriculture is particularly environmentally unfriendly. And it's private land. You don't have access except on, on, on uh, footpaths. But on the other hand, people have to leapfrog across the green belt in order to be able to afford space. So that hugely increases commuting journeys, and it also means that what houses we do build, build are built in sort of small additions to outlying villages, so all that housing is then car dependent uh, for, for, for people who live there. Uh, so green belts essentially only benefit those who actually live in them. And here's what a green belt looks like. So this is a uh, nice picture, I like these pictures. So this is a what is it, a golf course? No, it isn't a golf course. It's an abandoned golf course. And there are lots of abandoned golf courses. Uh, what is that? That's a Zone 6 station with a service to London Bridge. Every t uh, it takes 35 minutes. And this is a junction on the M25. You could hardly find a better place to build houses. There was an application to build a very modest development of 800 houses that turned out in the Greenbelt. 
Uh, and what's this? This is another abandoned golf course, not quite so obviously a golf course as the previous one. This is at the end of the Jubilee line in Stanmore. Can't build houses there either. And these are my, two of my favourites. This, believe it or not, is Tottenham Hale. It, almost in the middle of London, a big interchange, shabby car wash, application to build affordable, 250 affordable houses there in 2016, turned out, not because it's actually in the Green Belt, but because the inspector thought it might possibly, at its northern extremity, possibly be in the Green Belt. And here's where building stopped in 1939, North, Northwood was getting built out, war came, stopped developing, left land there, and it's a, it's a place for horses. People can't live there, but horses can. <laughs> so, adopt Green belts to serve green purposes. Identify and preserve immunity or environmentally rich land. We need open spaces. We don't want to build over vast tracts of the countryside that are beautiful or people benefit from. But then permit development on land with no amenity or environmental markers within 800 metres of commuter rail stations. Because it's far too expensive to build new rail links. It's too expensive. Our development... It, it, we simply won't do it, given how much it costs, particularly given the planning system, but that's another story. It costs 10 times as much per kilometre to build a kilometre of railway line in this country as it does in France. Can't, can't imagine why. Uh, so we could make better use of what we have, and that is environmentally much better. So then take out of that land that you identify 10% for green, new green space, which is actually going to be accessible for wildlife and, and recreation. So we worked this out in a paper we did for the centre of cities. Uh, we found uh, that, that, that just for five cities in the UK, you could identify 47,000 hectares of land, which was within 800 metres of commuter stations, 45 minutes to major employment centres. And on that land, depending on the densities you assumed, you could build 1.7 to 2 million houses. Uh, but that would actually only take 1.8% of the green belt anyway, hard, you know, hardly notice it in terms of loss of green belt, but it would actually be an improvement in environmental terms because you'd have all this extra green space land that you would then make accessible. Uh, and uh, so environmentally positive and it would encourage rail-based development rather than, uh, than car-based development. So this is just a picture of what we did for London. I'll just hurry up. I mean, this pink stuff is green belt. Oxford, you run into Oxford, you run into Cambridge. Uh, the green bits are things you shouldn't build on. That's areas aren't standing natural beauty, except this week they're called something else. They changed the name last week. Uh, natural, national landscapes, that's what we called this week. Uh, and here's where there are central cities. So all these other ones are stations which are within 45 minutes of central London, where, and they, you can't see it, but it identified how much land was there. So that's one thing that you could do very easily that would generate enough space with good communications to employment of roughly two million houses. Now another little point, this is a question of discretion. I said that it's expensive to have a discretionary system because it generates uncertainty. I'm going to illustrate this with a piece of research I did very recently. Because Christian and I, Christian Hilbert and I had already done some work back in the fact, following on from Cape Barker's review that demonstrated that there was a shortage of supply of office space in London generating, at the worst case, in the West End of London, the equivalent of an 800% tax on construction costs. Hugely increasing. So office space in Birmingham, for example, was 50% more expensive than it was in Manhattan. That wasn't because the building costs of Birmingham were very high. Uh, so why is that? It's because we've got height restrictions. It's very difficult to build high. How do you get a taller office, built, uh, office building built? Well, you game the system. You employ someone we call a, a trophy architect. I'll tell you in a moment. So what the shadow, what the Secretary of State, then Lord Prescott, God bless him. Uh, so what he said when he approving the shard on appeal as Secretary of State was we'd only approve skyscrapers of exceptional design. For a building of this size to be acceptable, the quality of its design is critical. The proposed tower is of the highest architectural quality. And how did he know that? He knew it because it was designed by Renzo Piano, who'd won two of the most prestigious <laughs> architectural lifetime achievement awards in, in, ever given. So what we did was we, you know, one of the things you find is that London has got remarkably few skyscrapers. That's over 100, uh, 100 metres tall, uh, as Gabriel will tell you. Uh, so, you know, Paris has got uh, Brisbane and Australia 
small provincial city, got six times as many skyscrapers as Paris. Paris, in 2010, had eight times as many as London. The only thing that London has is an incredibly high proportion of trophy architect design skyscrapers. So 25% of all skyscrapers in, in, in London are designed by these trophy architects. Compared to Chicago, the home of modern architecture, 3% or Brussels, zero. Why? Because trophy architects successfully game the system and persuade uh, the planners, or not the planners, the politicians, that this is a wonderful building that should be allowed. And we showed this in an article published in 2020, took a sample of 2,000 dollars office building sales across London. This shows you how little of London you can actually build tall on. This pinky stuff is conservation area. Huge tracts of central London are conservation areas. Can't build anything there at all above the, above the existing sky level. And then these are the sight lines. So my favourite is the sight line from Richmond to uh, St Paul's because you actually can't see uh, St Paul's from Richmond despite the sight line because the air is so murky for <laughs> at least 360 days a year. So what did we find? We found that trophy architects, if they designed the building, could get an extra 14.3 floors on, on their buildings. Uh, they also got a higher price per square metre. Uh, how did we know it was the trophy architect effect? Because we compared it with Chicago, because in Chicago they have an unrestricted, or height, height restrictions are almost non-existent, you can build anything that the zoning system says you can build, and on average, uh, sky, uh, offices in, in Chicago are 30 stories taller than they are in London. However, when a, someone gets a, a trophy architect, gets their award, lo and behold, in London, their offices grow by 14, more, more than 14 floors. Whereas in Chicago, nothing happens. In fact, they shrank. It wasn't statistically significant. This is my last slide, Richard. So to sum up, you can look at it, and I won't tell you what it says. Brilliant. We need to do Brilliant. something. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Well, I was, um, I was going to say I feel very small following that, but now I'm behind this thing, I realise I, so, I am very small and hardly any of you will be able to see me, but you're not missing much. Um, the first thing I want to say is that it's a terrific privilege to be asked to speak at an event to mark Paul's achievement in serious data work on housing and planning. I really don't know anybody who's done as much as, as Paul in proper data <coughs> terms. I certainly haven't. I've written reviews, but I have not tackled the data to anything like um, the um, technical way in which Paul has, and very, few and very few people have. So his articles on quantifying the cost of restrictive planning on rents, retail efficiency, and of course housing completely overshadow what I've been doing to try and think about housing supply and policy. So when I, 20 years ago, and I was at the Bank of England, I was asked by the government to work on reviews of housing and planning. I should say, this is the sort of period at the bank in the years 2000s when nothing much went on, that we didn't change interest rates very much and the financial system looked completely calm. We rather missed a gathering storm. So I had plenty of time to work on housing and planning. Um, I became very much aware of the wealth of academic work in this area, and particularly at the LSE. My own work, as I say, had been very much less academic. But I did some different things after I'd worked on the reviews, and indeed after I'd left the bank. So I worked in a number of, uh, for a number of boards in the public sector. I was on the board of what was then the Homes and Communities Agency. I've also been on the board of a building society and at a major house builder. So I may be less expert than Paul at handling data, but I have looked at the issues around planning and housing from a number of viewpoints, and I've got some appreciation of the messy and sometimes murky world of development. In fact, I often said that the reason I went on the board of a house builder was I was interested to see whether the housing, the behaviour of a house builder in practice was the same as I thought it was in theory. And unusually, for an econo economist, I found that it was. <laughs> was, um, I, was very I was quite surprised. So I think that, but the importance about the work is it's not just about the economic cost of an overly restrictive planning system. It's often putting that cost in, in human terms. Paul's work on retail, the town centre first, was important when I, when I did the work. 
And actually, he didn't mention the, I'm not even sure whether it still exists, I'm somewhat out of touch, he didn't even mention the needs test on retail, <laughs> Paul, which I um, suggested should be abolished, because when I was doing the work on housing, on planning, I discovered that in order for anybody to open a, a retail store, they had to prove that there was a need for an extra chemist or bookshop or whatever, which is a, frankly, a deeply um, uncompetitive thing, and it was instructive when I looked at the respondents to the final review to notice that incumbent retailers were not very keen on the dis disposal of the needs test and retailers interested in getting a foothold were really quite enthusiastic about it. And I think it's also fair to say that since then, changes in consumer behaviour have in any event rather repurposed high streets and the imperative for physical retail units to have scale and low costs of land has probably increased. So the good intentions of planners often become costly attempts to hold back the tide. I think a very natural question is why Paul's done all this work, which just shown you these figures that demonstrate that huge benefits can come from a less restrictive planning system. I did some top-down reviews, there's been a wealth of other material, but yet there's been no real progress on handling supply in particular. I don't, by the way, think I got everything right in my housing review. I did think at the time that I'd managed to get housing supply into the minds of politicians, and actually it has generally remained in the public debate. Um, the subsequent housing ministers, the 300 or so of them we've had, um, have generally talked about supply, even if they haven't been very necessarily very, very good at setting targets, and it matters that ministers think supply matters. Supply is a crude total, however, isn't the only thing that matters. But undersupply is such an important structural undercurrent in the housing problem. Prices and rents, of course, tend to be cyclical. Paul showed you some pretty sharp ups and downs in some of the prices. But the point is, if you don't build enough, in each successive cycle, the average for house prices and the average for rents compared with incomes will rise if supply is structurally inadequate. But it's really hard to land this point squarely with the public. Why is that? Well, I think, first of all, at a local area, at any point in time, it's actually quite hard to discern the beneficial effects of building houses and the evil of not building houses. The appeal to long-term economic and social benefits never seemed to quite weigh the points raised by people who don't want the houses built and say, my road will be busier, I won't get a GP appointment anymore. And day-to-day -day observation can really conceal the economic damage. So a question I asked people when leading the review was, if we've been undersupplying homes in Britain, for so, England for so long, a lot of this discussion is about England, where have all the people gone? And I'm going to sort of talk about this by talking about the 2010s. So at the beginning of the 2010s, the Office for National Statistics said that they thought we would need about 210,000 house, houses a year to be built because they thought that's how many new households would form. We actually only built 170,000 houses a year during the 2010s. So that's 40,000 short, or over 10 years, 400,000. Now, it's manifestly clear we don't have an extra 400,000 people who are homeless and sleeping on the streets. The numbers are, numbers, well, not very good, and very, very much less than that. So what actually happened? Well, what didn't happen was the um, ONS projection for total population was, all, was pretty much right. Um, if you look at back what they expected in 2010 and what we actually got when we had the census in 2021, they were pretty close. But the ONS projection for households was, of course, wrong because households, you know, rather tediously, don't form if there's nowhere for them to form. So what happened to these people? Well, 70,000 young people a year, and young people is 20 to 34, extra, stayed, were li stayed living with their parents. And that is a and that is a pretty big part of the explanation of why the households didn't emerge. In addition, we actually succeeded in bringing 10,000 um, homes, empty homes a year back into use. Actually, we have one of the lowest rates of empty homes in the UK of, uh, among, the, among the OECD. It's worth saying this because it's often produced as an answer to our problems. So what's the damage? Does it matter that we had all these people still living at home? Well, those people who didn't have an extra child living at home, and I enjoyed my son living at home throughout the 2010s, um, might think it, there's not much damage at all. But this is a large number of young people who've had to delay independent living. 
and they're very likely working in the wrong job as far as their skills are concerned because their area of job search is clearly limited. It's limited to where they can get to from their parents' house and that is very damaging to productivity. Now, Paul would look at this question, he would identify and quantify correctly what the damage to productivity is, which I have not, which I have not done. But it is clear to me that there is some, quite in, a, quite in addition to the social strain on family life and the delaying of people um, getting together with their girlfriends and getting, and getting married. Unless, obviously, the working of demand versus supply, of course, drove house prices up and meant that those who did move out were all find that, that market housing, buying or renting, would all be that little bit more expensive for everyone. There is also probably some very real social damage. It's one thing for me to laugh about the time I spent doing my son's washing up. But people in social housing are often overcrowded to start with. Having to accommodate older children is a, is a genuine problem. But again, perhaps this is a problem that is not terribly visible to the kind of people who protest about new development. It ought to be a matter of concern to us all that in England, the social housing stock today is over 100,000 lower than it was in 2001. Affordable rent may have a role to play. There's a clear shortage of a secure form of tenancy. I should say that um, quite a lot of Ukrainians come in 2022 to live in, with people in our village who were lucky enough to have extra homes for them. And when they came to the end of the six months, many of them thought, well, we'll just apply for housing and we'll be given a house. And it was a big shock to them to discover that, in fact, it didn't quite work like that in Britain because there was no, there was no social housing to be had. Paul also referred to the volatility of the market. This is, a, this is, a real, this is a, another problem. So in England, the, the net supply numbers fell to a low in 2013 of around 130,000. It then revived to the high 240,000, um, still well below the 300,000, which has begun the usual target for government ministers. Then, of course, it was knocked down by COVID to 220,000. It's picked up a bit since then, but it's likely to fall again when the numbers come out next year because of the big rise in mortgage interest rates. This market volatility, which is partly the result of a constrained system, has really difficult impacts. It impacts on capacity. When the market turns down and you have to cut back on new supply, you immediately lose skills in the building industry. And my experience at Taylor Wimpy suggests that people who've been found another job inside are not always that keen to go outside brick lane. You tend to lose smaller builders because they can't cope with the volatility, so you end up with a housing industry which is very dominated by big builders. So you need to have peaks that are well above the, the um, ongoing requirements. You might also think, can it be addressed? I perhaps won't go into this question now because I'm worried I too may go on for too long. But I think we might want to think again about the mix we use of fiscal and monetary policy in crises. And, um, so I'll leave that to something that somebody might want to ask about. Richard said right at the beginning that there's much more interest in this now. I've been to two events um, in the last week, one um, from, run by the Productivity Institute and one run by the Resolution Foundation. And at both, there was a lot of commentary on, ha on planning holding us back, referring to, house to both housing and business. I'm leaving business issues here to Simon Wolfson. Now, it's great to hear that there's renewed focus, but it does worry me. The first thing is that there's a tendency just to throw out the term planning. We're held back by planning. What do they mean? National government policy, the lack of local plans, there are far too few local plans, the way in which planners on the ground balance competing interests in taking decisions, the uncertainty, how local voices are heard and considered. And if time isn't taken to think about why there hasn't been more progress, we won't succeed. We will simply be back here again in 10 years. There are some obviously good ideas that are emerging. I completely agree with Paul about the green belt, not just bits, but think about the whole purpose and acknowledge the damage around Oxford and Cambridge. Just in passing, Paul, you referred to the fact that um, in London they built the green belt to stop Labour voters moving in. I assume the green belt around Stoke was to stop Conservative voters moving <laughs> in. <laughs> That's not such a funny, funny joke now, we have, now that Stoke too has um, a lot of Conservatives. Bigger spatial areas. We need to plan over bigger spatial areas. We need to plan bigger. I actually, more than Paul probably, believe in planning. And you need to plan over big, you need to plan over bigger areas. We have to plan for the right things. You also then, when you plan for them, have to check they've happened. I'm always surprised by how many local authorities don't really check that things have happened. Um, and also, if we plan over larger areas, 
and force numbers down to local authorities. They're left helpfully with someone to blame. Local authorities need someone to blame. It would also encourage people to think about the infrastructure we need. Um, Paul talked about Cambridge. Michael Gove has said we need another 250,000 houses near Cambridge. That may or may not be right. Sadly, applications for as few as 1,000 houses are being turned down in Cambridge now because there is an inadequate water, and the reason there is inadequate water is because the water regulator decided that there wouldn't be lots of houses built around Cambridge and didn't let Anglia water invest in them. Um, new towns or very big urban extensions are clearly going to be needed. Land prices and, as and assembly will be difficult. It will need a lot of political will. The other thing that will need a lot of political will is forcing local authorities to produce local plans. Goodness knows it is one thing that the Conservatives have tried to do, but it's been very hard, been very hard to keep going. I'm perhaps a bit less persuaded by Paul about the rules-based system. But I think this is partly because I suspect that when we, the planners had finished making the rules, we found that it wasn't, any, it, wasn't really any, it wasn't really any better. Anyway, I'll wind up now, Richard. I think it's as important as good ideas. Planning is beset by recurrent bad ideas. One of the things is we only have smaller households forming. We only, need small, we only have a need for small households. Um, so we only need to build little houses, and this is because planners think in terms of need and they don't think in terms of demand. Older people apparently should move to smaller houses. I suspect this would have limited impact. Builders are blamed because they land bank or fail to build out permissions, and it doesn't really matter how many reviews you have saying that's not true, it still comes back as an idea. Empty homes, I've already commented, we have relatively few of these. And then a desire to speed up planning. It's certainly true that some authorities offer a bad service, but I actually think it is true we care about what's built. We care that somebody had a look at the application and it looks right. What we need is more toothpaste in the tube. We need more applications coming, coming forward. The time they take to decide is not so relevant. So what will matter here is government purpose. Localism brutally has failed in high demand areas. The imperative of climate change versus opposition to pylons and solar farms is showing up the failure of individuals to consider externalities. I hope that this will galvanise the next government, but I hope it will also galvanise them to look at a proper evidence base, the kind of work Paul does, and not rely on the shorthand of bad ideas. Very good. Thank you. That, that was very interesting. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. 12 minutes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Right, thank you, and um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, I fear some of what I say may uh, repeat what you've already heard, but um, it's a fantastic we're having this event. I um, want to begin by saying that I often, often think that land use planning doesn't get the attention it should. Though there are exceptions, it's true. But in general, I don't think it's mentioned as much as it should be. And certainly rarely gets top billing, though maybe that's changing, in debates about economic growth, productivity performance, trends in the distribution of wealth, and much else. Yet I've learnt it's crucial. I say that in substantial part because of the work of Paul Cheshire and a few other stalwarts of the economics of land use planning. So I'm delighted, therefore, to be able to say a few words about housing and land use planning and to be able to celebrate the 40 years of work Paul has devoted to this subject. Paul has long been at the vanguard um, of the application of economics to our land use planning system, though always clear about the need for a system of land use planning to correct otherwise serious market failures. Paul's work has drawn out again and again, as he has this evening, the potential costs and unintended consequences of how we've designed our current system. I know I've learned an enormous amount from him and his work, as have many others, and that's profoundly influenced my, see my thinking and certainly the advice that I've given in my job. Paul brings together empirical rigour and robustness, clarity of thinking and insight, and effective use of the written and spoken word. I'll say more about his um, academic work on land use planning and housing in a moment, but first a few words about his career. It's a fantastic career. 
So the starting point was in 1964, if not earlier, when he earned a degree in economics from Downing College, Cambridge, a stepping stone to serving as an economist at the then Ministry of Overseas Development. His academic career began a bit later in 1970 as a lecturer at Reading University, from where he steadily built his academic reputation, earning the prestigious Donald Robertson Memorial Prize in 1989 for his work on major urban regions. Delving with Stephen Shepherd into the complex realm of, el of urban economics to shed light on the costs and benefits of land use planning. Earning the Royal Economic Society's prize for the best paper in the Economic Journal in 2004 for work on capitalising the value of free schools. Taking forward pioneering work on incorporating price signals into planning decisions, which culminated in a 2005 paper on the introduction of price signals into land use planning decision making, still highly relevant to this day. Winning the European Regional Science Association Uranium European Investment Bank's Prize for Lifetime Contribution to Regional Science Research in 2009. He was awarded a CBE in 2017 for his services to economics and housing. And he's advocated radical yet pragmatic solutions to the housing crisis, such as his 2019 proposals in Homes on the Right Tracks taken us through today, and which are good for freeing up land near railway stations in the Greenbelt for housing development. Currently Emeritus Professor of Economic Geography here at the London School of Economics, he is the author of, or co-author of more than 100 papers, so I've barely scratched the surface of his work. Paul has um, led the application, as I say, of economics and economic analysis to our land use planning system and its impact on housing and other outcomes. Thanks to him, we've got a much better understanding of the housing challenges we currently face and crucially, how and why they have arisen. Those like me who work on these issues are greatly in his intellectual debt. A distinctive feature of this country, though as Paul has shown again this evening, similar trends can be observed in other countries that have adopted aspects of our land use planning system is that housing has become increasingly unaffordable over time. So in 1997, the ratio of median house prices to earnings was 3.5 in England. In 2022, it was 8.3. In some parts of the country, the changes are even greater. So in London and the South East, the ratios have risen from 4 and 4.2 respectively in 1997 to 12.5 and 10.8 in 2022. As a consequence, the UK has some of the most expensive housing in the world, and the resulting decline in housing affordability has had various effects. So over the past 20 years, the overall rate of homeownership has fallen to 64% from a peak of 71%, um, and, though, and though stable in the latter part of that period, in the past decade, there have been more outright homeowners than owners with a mortgage, which is a very significant change in the post-war period. As Paul and others have said, young people have been particularly hard hit, whilst home ownership rates amongst the over 65s have been steadily rising for decades, home ownership rates amongst 19 to 29 year olds fell by two thirds in the period 1989 to 2013, from 23% to 8% though there's been a subsequent recovery to 12% over the period to 2021, that still means that young people are half as likely to own their home today as young people 30 years ago. This has led to an increased number of concealed households, as uh, Kate referred to, with the number of adults living with their parents rising by nearly uh, 700,000 in the decade to 2021. And we see rising housing costs, adding to pressures at the bottom end of the housing market from an expanding private rented sector, and increasing pressures on homelessness, which in turn put growing financial pressures on local authorities. So why has this happened? Well, the empirical work that Paul has done and the evidence he has assembled shows powerfully that housing supply, cons housing supply constraints are the main driver. As Paul has said in a seminar with Christian Hilbra in my department just last week, and again this evening, it's the supply side stupid. 
Paul's early work, notably his 1989 paper, British Planning Policy and Access to Housing, introduced a concept of scarcity rents. Planning system by restricting land use for various purposes creates artificial scarcity. Between 1975 and 2022, house prices in the UK increased by 142% in real terms, whilst house building fell 46% from, believe it or not, over 378,000 units in 1970 to just over 205,000 units in 2022. Cumulatively, Paul and others have estimated there's a shortfall in housing supply in this country of over 4 million units since the passing of the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act. A quite remarkable statistic and why perhaps to this day increasing housing supply remains at the heart of housing policy. As the cumulative backlog in supply has risen, so have house prices. Housing affordability has deteriorated as real incomes and the size of the population have grown, increasing the demand for housing against a backlog of constrained supply. In a 2002 paper, the Welfare Economics and Land Use Planning, Paul and Stephen Shepherd looked at the economic costs and benefits of land use, land use planning in southern England. This revealed a negative net effect with costs amounting to almost 4% of annual household income. The data on which that study was based is now 40 years old and the costs to households today are almost certainly greater. These supply side impacts of our land use planning system have been compounded as both Paul and Kate have pointed out by case by case development control as opposed to zoning and second by the decision uh, by placing decision making at the lowest tier of local government which is perhaps more vulnerable to capture by NIMBYs. Paul has shown moreover that not only have we not built enough houses, those houses we have built have tended to be constructed in the wrong places. Um, famously Paul has noted that um, Barnsley and Doncaster, and he repeated this this evening, built um, just over 56,000 houses over the 40 years to 2018, while Oxford and Cambridge had only 29,000 houses built. By contrast, the population growth was 29,000 in Barnsley and over 95,000 in Oxford and Cambridge. Paul observed a few years ago that green belts are a handsome subsidy to horsey culture and golf. Since our planning system prevents housing competing, land for golf courses stays very cheap. As a result, more of Surrey is now used for golf courses, he observed, than has housing on it. Of course, shortfalls in housing supply aren't the only potential drivers of uh, rising house prices and falling housing affordability. Falling interest rates over a long period may have added to demand. Tighter regulation of mortgage availability will have attenuated that effect, but Paul and others' work has shown that falling interest rates alone cannot explain the rise in house prices. Some have expressed concern that the growth in the private rented sector and the increasing availability of buy-to-let mortgages has added to housing market demand and di displaced first-time buyers. Whilst, of course, there may be such effects, Paul's work suggests to me that the cumulative shortfall in housing supply, supply substantially dwarfs the number of first-time buyers who might have been displaced by housing demand from private landlords. It's also worth noting that um, restrictions on housing supply create price risk for house builders, impacting on their operating model and driving land, land banking and other behaviours that compound the supply elasticity, uh, inelasticity uh, arising from the land use planning system. So there's a key insight here that whether it's growth in the private rented sector and buy-to-let mortgages, concerns about second homes and foreign buyers, behaviours such as land banking, these are fundamentally perhaps symptoms of the supply side issues that we've discussed rather than causes of them. Paul's um, work has also shown, as we've heard this evening, that um, the planning system also has significant effects on non-residential property uh, markets. So in his 20, 2007 work, Office Space Supply Restrictions in Britain, he drew attention to the regulatory tax effectively placed by the planning system on office supply. That, that research demonstrated that Britain has the most extensive office 
space globally due to the regulatory tax imposed by the planning system which constrained uh, development. Office space in Birmingham was found to be 44% more expensive than in Manhattan. High housing and other property costs have led not only to rising housing unaffordability, but impacting ne negatively on productivity, economic growth and wealth inequalities. A lack of um, housing density around our core cities and transport nodes limits effective city size, hampering productivity gains that could be realised through increased agglomeration economies. And as Paul has pointed out, policies such as Town Centre First have empirically demonstrated negative effects on total factor productivity. Additionally, house prices and worsening affordability have contributed to increased wealth inequality. So on average between 2018 and 2020, individuals in the, which is 10% of the population are at a third of their total wealth in property, whereas individuals in the poorest 10% had no property wealth at all. And wealth inequality has been increasing both across regions and generations. So regionally, medium individual wealth is almost £160,000 higher in the southeast than the northeast, which is largely explained by property owners and property values. And today's younger generations are far less likely to own their home than previous generations. So today's 30-year-olds are half as likely to own their home as those aged 30 in the 1980s. Fundamentally, Paul's work has pointed to the need to reform of our planning system, and in a series of papers and studies, he has made various innovative proposals. First, I'll just highlight, briefly highlight three. First, the use of price signals to inform land use plans. Second, his proposals for stations in the Greenbelt, which he's talked us through today. And thirdly, his insights into the regulatory tax effectively resulting for, um, from restrictions on office development. So in summary, Paul's work has significantly informed our understanding of the planning system's impacts on land use, housing affordability, inequality, productivity and economic growth. His research has encouraged policymakers, scholars and urban planners to reconsider and refine existing approaches, emphasising the importance of balancing regulatory measures with economic principles to achieve more equitable, economically efficient and sustainable urban development. His career stands as a testament to his unwavering dedication to unravelling the complexities of urban economics and land use planning and as a beacon of intellectual rigour and innovative thinking. So it's been a real pleasure to talk through his work this evening and look forward to comments and discussions. I sense that, um, that I, I sort of did a rough calculation. That we were asked to speak for 12 minutes, which really meant 15 minutes, which gives me about three minutes um, <laughs> before we switch to, uh, to questions. So I'm in the very fortunate position, I have to say, um, of most of the previous speakers having said what I was going to say anyway. So I can cut out large swathes of my, my speech and say that I agree wholeheartedly with everything that has been said before. Before, before I go into the details, though, I just, um, there are two things I want to say. The first is I want to answer the question that I know will be on every single one of your lips this evening. Every single one of you will be looking at me with one question, and I'm going to answer it now, get it out of the way. This is, in fact, a next suit. Top of the range, <laughs> available online. You, you, um, for the gentleman in the room, you can look as good as this, um, and as smart. Um, for as little as £99. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way first. Um, second, uh, the second thing I wanted to really say is that rather than sort of go through the litany of complaints and problems with our planning system that we have, which have been explained extremely well, I want to just to kick off with one fact. And that is that in the small sort of village that I live at, just outside Milton Keynes, um, an acre of agricultural land is worth about... £15,000, um, an acre of land with open planning permission for housing on it will be worth about one and a half million pounds. And if you want to understand the nature of the problem um, that we have in the UK, that one statistic sums it all up. 
because that's where all the money's going. All the money that could be invested in better quality homes, in more spacious homes, in the homes that we want to live in, in the infrastructure that is needed to support those homes, including the schools and the GPs, surgeries that are needed for new homes, all of that money is swallowed up in the land. But it's worse than that. It's worse than that because it's not just the cost of the land. The cost of getting the planning permission itself can cost up to 10% of the cost of any development that we've been in. Just really been about getting lawyers and planning consultants and the time, the time taken is often not, it's not even included as a cost. But as we return to a, a world where money is no longer free, it will become increasingly apparent that the two or three or four years it can take to get planning permission for a relatively simple development, um, a warehouse we've recently built, it took us much less time to build the shed than it did to get planning permission for the shed. And time is money. And all that cost leads to worse homes, worse shops, worse offices, um, poorer infrastructure. And that leads to a very ironic effect. It leads to the effect that we have that people lose faith in new housing. They begin to think that actually new buildings are bad and therefore we need more planning to stop it. And you end up with planners saying what we really must do is only build that which is needed. Because it might be, you know, anything else we don't say that about food, do we, or holidays? We're only going to have the holidays in Britain that people really need. Um, or the food that they really need. And we don't do that in any other market, but in housing, because the assumption is under, under, underneath it all is that new homes, houses, offices, places of work and leisure are bad, we need to constrain it. Um, and I think what this all comes down to is one very simple thing. And I'm going to, you know, it's, it's a great privilege to be here in the London School of Economics. I, you know, I, I have to say, sitting up here with all these sort of great minds and speaking in the London School of Economics, I, I had that whole sort of slight imposter syndrome thing, it's like here is me talking to the, you know, all these economists, but it strikes me that this is a classic case of what we all know, and that is that planned economies don't work. You know, the, you, 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 know you, you can fall back on Stalin's excuses, you know, first of all blame the planners, then blame the plan, then blame everyone else. Doesn't matter, you know, doctors, officers, kulaks, whoever it is. And in the case of our planning system, it seems that that's what we're doing. We, we're, you know, we go from saying, oh, it's just the wrong plan, um, or the system needs tweaking, or it's the people in it. So it's the developers, the evil developers, the evil planners, the evil councillors, whoever it is, is, you know, all the actors get blamed. And eventually, after a while, you know, of seeing the same play with lots of different actors in it, you conclude, actually, you know, it's not the it's not the actors that are at fault. It's the play. It's the whole system needs to be rebooted. It comes, I think, it's what Paul was saying about a rules-based system, but actually, we need to stop calling it planning because something as complex, as difficult, as where 65 million people live, work, um, shop, enjoy their leisure time, something as complex as that cannot be planned top-down. It's as simple as that. Um, planners do not have the right incentives they don't have the right knowledge, um, they, don't, they are not able to, no fault of their own, but they're not able to innovate, experiment, try new things in a way that a, um, a proper, vibrant, evolutionary market can. And, of course, they constantly suffer from political interference, um, which has been, a, you know, whether that political be interference be, we don't want your sort of jobs, which I have been told, um, by a planner. I don't want to embarrass Chichester, but, you know, there we go. Um, um, I don't want to, um, you know, and I won't, actually, um, but one town, I won't, I won't embarrass, there was one town where the chief planning officer, a very nice man, you know, edu highly educated, hard-working, dedicated man, dedicated to his plan, wanted us to build a shop on one side of Maidstone. Sorry, did I say it? Um, well, now, that side of Maidstone was the side that the motorway wasn't on. Um, and the catchment from that area, 20-minute catchment from where he wanted us to build this shop, was about 15,000 people. Build the other side of town, close to the motorway, and it went to about 100,000. But he wanted us to build where people, the wrong way, the wrong end of the one-way system, and on a piece of land, wait for it, that wasn't going to be available for five years because currently it was a station. That's where we were going to put our shop. 
And although that sounds absurd, that is, um, that is I think, uh, just one example of how planned economies don't work and how planners aren't able to function. And I say that with no criticism of planners, who in my experience actually work terribly hard and try to do a good job, but are basically trying to do the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> you know, um, so the alternative, and let's just start with the scare story, because the scare story is that the alternative to a ruthlessly planned system is a free-for-all. Free-for-all, concreted over, end of Britain, you know, it's all going to basically be garages and forecourts. Um, because there's only one alternative to a planned economy, and that is a free-for-all laissez-faire. But of course, um, that's not true. There's, you know, free markets are not laissez-faire. They can be regulated. They are regulated by both the rule of law and specific regulation for those particular um, markets. And it works extremely well. Um, and before I move on to my suggestion as to what, how this, you know, the sort of principles of this sort of system might, might look like, I want to start, I want to address one very uncomfortable thought. And it's one that I think we all need to square up to. And that is that when you buy a home with a beautiful view, you don't buy the view. It's not yours. All that land around your house, you buy your house, your property. You don't buy, you know, you happen to have a view for 20 miles, you don't buy that view. Now, I think you have the right, as a homeowner, as someone who lives in a house, to insist that other people around, who build around you don't do so in such a way as to undermine the value of what you've bought. But that's not quite the same thing as controlling and having a say in everything that goes on in the land around you. And that's the way people feel. In the village in which I live, there is a campaign called Save Our Sheep Fields. It's not our sheep fields. It belongs to some poor man who wants to just build a few houses on it. But there's a Save Our Sheep Fields um, that has not only appropriated what's best for that field, but has appropriated the ownership of it as well. It's our sheep field. Um, and what would be a great development with six new homes on it is being ruthlessly opposed by people whose the value of their home won't be affected one iota by it. And the problem with this system where homeowners and property owners take unto themselves the rights of ownership of all the land around them and begin to talk as if they should control what is built, the problem is that it is hugely regressive. Because in essence what we're doing is we are putting the power of greater property ownership in the hands of people who already own property. We're transferring wealth from those who don't own property to those who do, from young to old, from north to south, um, and that is incredibly dangerous. So my view is that we are gonna to have to have a, a big debate, and I, my guess is that it will be the students in this university, people who are studying today who will see a solution to this. this is no, there is no quick fix to this. But we need to have a proper argument, a proper debate about what sort of system we have. And my view is, start at the other end. Start where all markets start. Start that the land that you own, you can build on. But there are principles to what, to what you're allowed to do. In the same way there are principles to how you drive your car or how you produce food or how you make clothes. And those the two key ones, in my view, should be the love your neighbour principle. It's an old one, but a goodie. Um, and that is that you can't build anything that will damage your neighbour's wealth. And secondly, the carry your weight principle. That if you're going to build new houses, shops um, and offices, you need to pay for the infrastructure to get it to the point at least where it's no worse than it was before. Layer on top of that, a regulatory environment with building standards that ensure that, that houses are built to the right quality, that don't damage the environment, that are safe. And suddenly you have a framework for a dynamic market that is driven by genuine needs and those people who understand them best, which are the people who put their hands in their pockets to do the building, but which is controlled in such a way that it doesn't damage the legitimate interests of all the other people who've invested in their homes and workplaces. And it strikes me that if we start there, we can build a much better system than one that starts 
with a flawed engine, the 1947 Act just doesn't work. Repeal it, start again, come up with something much, much better that achieves the aims that we can all agree on. And on that bombshell, I'm going to finish. Thank you. Twelve minutes. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, we've had wonderful presentations, um, absolute cornucopia, cornucopia um, and we haven't got a lot of time. So I proceed the following. We will have three questions from the floor. We will have three questions online. Uh, and then we will have all the authors respond to whichever question they want to ask, answer, and to each other, and that'll take up the remaining time. So, uh, who wants to... On the, <laughs> oh, uh, look at that. Um, Chap in orange. Make it a question and short, okay. and say who you are. Okay. Um, my name is Zakaria, LSC alumnus. Um, as you rightly mentioned, there is a clear market failure um, in the housing. Um, I wonder if the system um, isn't functioning as it's set out to be, um, as in as it should be. If you look at housing allowances, for example, <clears throat> doesn't the current government stand to benefit if it gives them out, um, assuming that it may or may not be the one to pay it afterwards? Okay, thank you. In the back? Uh, Omar Johnson, um, teacher. Uh, the government. So, so hold it up, oh, thanks. The government recently abolished uh, Section 21. Now, what impact is this going to have on both sides, the private and uh, the, the renters? That's what I want to know. What impact is going to have for abolishing Section 21? Lady here. Sorry, are you a lady? <laughs> no, sorry, it's this chap. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, sorry, couldn't hear what we said. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Charlie Alderser, down from Leeds Uni. Uh, quick question regarding uh, primarily uh, doc, uh, Professor Chester's point on development around railway networks, uh, or more actually railway hubs, um, you, uh, and also where we're building wrong. Um, you seem to say uh, that because we're developing on this sort of cheaper land um, that is outside of the more metropolitan areas, that's an inherent market failure. Uh, how would you say that interacts with sort of the arguments by uh, Dr... I think, oh, I forget his first name, but uh, Dr Oberman, that we should be built primarily targeting our house building to cities out other than London in order to make uh, to drag them up to productivity value rather than keep dumping uh, stuff into London. Uh, also, I'm really sorry I couldn't ask a question of you, Lord Wolfston. Uh, it was a wonderful lesson in oratory. Okay, now, Martin, you're going to read... Can we answer those three first? And I think we'll have forgotten the questions by the time. Okay, right. From online, we have Kate, a uh, circular economy advisor from Norfolk. Uh, she asks, how can we make sure that the buildings, if we do get permission to build on land, the buildings that we build are sustainable, uh, given the amount of building that could take place. Um, Oliver Wainwright in The Guardian, uh, sorry, this question is from Geoffrey Thomas. Oliver Wainwright in The Guardian reported on the state of Britain's housing uh, current. Um, and Geoffrey asks, who exactly will build high quality houses? What do we have in the labor market? And the last question from online is a former councillor, John Cartledge, uh, who opines his time as councillor, trying to uh, get buildings made on green belts and other pieces of land. And he asks, how can councils resist pressure from their electorate in order to get buildings put through? Thank you so much. Now, so many issues raised by the speakers and by the questions, 
Um, why don't we, can we just proceed in this order? Is Stephen, Stephen. going right. first? Okay. Um, and and you, you've got... I'll be brief. You, you've got maximum three minutes. I'll be brief. Um, I'm not sure I picked up all the questions, but um, uh, just, just to answer a few of them, uh, there was a question about... And, and speak into the mic. There was a question about Section uh, 21. So this is about um, reforms to the private rented sector and the circumstances in which landlords can um, retake possession. I mean, the positive thing about that, of course, is the security that it gives to tenants. But very, very briefly, um, it won't, of course, in itself do anything to increase housing supply. And the, um, the main theme of this um, session is the crucial importance of increasing housing supply if you want to do something about housing affordability. That may take time, um, but ultimately, whether it's uh, private rented housing or, or housing for sale, we need more ha houses. Um, there's a question about uh, London versus other cities. Um, my own view is that we need to be very careful in, in a levelling up or other contexts in thinking in sort of what I call um, zero-sum gain terms. Um, I'm sure, as Paul has pointed out, that there would be important gains to London's economy from allowing the right sorts of development uh, in and around the, the, the capital. But that doesn't rule out taking measures to do things in our second-tier cities, which several reports in the past few weeks have shown are lagging behind in productivity terms. And there are important things that you might be able to do, whether it's through intra-urban transport, improving the density of housing provision to enable those cities to earn the sorts of agglomeration economies that we see in London and thus improve their productivity performance and the living standards of the people who live there. On the quality of uh, built housing, I would just note that with land prices accounting so much of the price of a new house, um, um, inevitably, inevitably, there are pressures to keep down the construction costs. The house builders can't do anything about the price of land, so you know there's a terrible tension there. If there was more housing supply, if land wasn't as expensive, I suspect there would be beneficial effects on housing quality. Um, and then um, there was a question, finally, a question about how do we, how do we persuade the electorate um, to support the building of more houses? Um, as several people have said, there might be something here about, well, what is the relevant electorate? Is too, much, is too many decisions taken at too local a level might um, a role for um, uh, more upper tiers of local government enable... Uh, future, the interests of future generations better to be taken into account, for example. But I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, I'll try and say a little bit about um, the quality of housing, and I'll say it because of my time with a house builder. I think I'll say two things to start with. One is nobody really, or we certainly didn't, set out to build really rubbish houses. But actually, building if you're building 14,000 houses a year... The truth is, quite a number of them will have problems. And they'll have problems because it's really hard to keep an eye on every contractor and make sure they've put the screws in the cupboard that they've then put something in front of and you can't check that they've done it. And sometimes things just go wrong. I mean, Paul talked about trophy architects, but sometimes um, it, it simply goes wrong. So on the worst development um, that Taylor Wimpy ever built was designed by Richard Rogers. It was under the £60 housing thing that John Prescott produced. We tried very hard to build houses for £60,000, and I think we spent about that much again remediating them. But So I, I think it is possible to build for good, to build for good quality. I'm slight, and I, I'm not, this, but it does depend, as others have said, on getting the total package right, and this may mean arguing down land prices, and how we tackle that issue is extremely difficult and I don't think I have a good answer. I do, however, think that it, it can be done with more regulation because if you have regulation in place about how many affordable houses you have to build, how many um, points you have to pin in for electric cars, how much you have to provide for climate change and all the builders need to stick to it, it does get passed back into land prices. Land prices <laughs> are not just something that God given, they are the result of a bargain in the system. And actually, I think it's a regulatory failure that land prices have risen so high. 
Thank you, Kate. Okay. So, yeah, I'm only going to, just two questions. First of all, um, oh, very good, I've got a mic man here. Um, so first of all, the, the question about quality. Um, I think this is really, really important because in any market, my view is the only thing that really ensures quality is competition. Because if you've got no choice on the house that you buy, then you know you, you buy whatever you, whatever's there. But if there's competition, why would you build a rubbish quality house? Because you're not going to sell it. So the only, you know, it all comes down to the same principle that com highly competitive um, free markets that are properly regulated produce better quality product at lower prices because the best people produce great quality because that's their job. And if they don't, um, as you've all seen with my suit today, if they don't produce great quality, um, like my suit is great quality, then they won't look as good as I did tonight. And <laughs> then they won't get halves back to the LSE. So the market is working. Secondly, um, Dr. Oberman's um, point about really what we need to do is to get people to live where he wants them to live. I find that, I find that really very odd, um, but it's one that sort of pollutes the whole economic debate. Okay, just checking, just checking because uh, I'm sorry, Doctor, apologies. Um, but the idea that somehow we're going to improve the productivity out of people outside London, or indeed of the country, by forcing people to live places where that is not their ideal choice is entirely wrong-faced and we're much better to say let the people go to the productivity rather than try and force the productivity to go to the people because the latter won't work. Okay. Sorry doctor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right, so now Paul you, you, you started this off and you, you started yourself all rowing uh, decades ago. Uh, you've had some comments from uh, members of the panel uh, and you've had some questions. Uh, give us your final words of wisdom. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll try to do that uh, for their wisdom. Um, I mean, I've heard some very interesting and, and a lot of what has been said tonight, I agree. Uh, I think it was you, Simon, that pointed out that one of the outcomes of our system is a huge transfer of real assets to people in the southeast of London and away from people in the north. Build, you know, we can already see we're building more houses in, in the north per capita, it's much easier to build houses in, in the north than it is in the south because there's less nimbyism in the north because they want the jobs to build the houses. But it also means that if you lose your job in Hartlepool, your feet are nailed to the ground because you cannot possibly afford to move to somewhere in the southeast where there may be jobs. So it really does restrict people's life chances by being not able to move to areas where there's more opportunity. So the major moment at which people move is when they go to the university and then they can stay and they do. So we should be building more houses in Manchester, we should be building more houses in Leeds, but we should be building far more houses where they're least affordable. So give a map of affordability, the house price to median income ratio, and that tells you where you should be building houses because that's where they're scarcest and people can't afford them. Um, now, I just come back to this question about uh, pressures from councils. Now, I, I was just asked actually by Stephen, or he, he, he sort of fabricated me into writing a, a paper comparing international planning systems. Uh, I have some sympathy with what you said about planning and the all power. And, you know, we're almost at the area, in moment of Brezhnev's Russia, where you fed bread to pigs because it's cheaper. So, you know, you find land you can build a house on in Barnet, and it's not uh, 1.5 million pounds a hectare. If you've got no planning regulations, if it's no obligations, it's 40 million pounds mm. per hectare. Mm. Now, that is a price distortion of a most extravagant type because of the rationing of something which is in scarce supply. So, but there is pressure, and our planning system is, is very distinctive. Because it's ours, we think of it as a natural, given, <laughs> God-given thing. It isn't. It's a very strange construction that was the result of the 1947 Act, which I agree with you is deeply flawed. And the result is that the only voice is the local voice. Sensible planning systems, like in France, A, have a rule-based system. So in France, I wanted to double the size of my house in the countryside. So what did I do? I read the local plan. It was a democratically elected plan, three years previously, saying what you could do, setting down design guides, etc. I read the plan. 14 days later, I had planning permission. 
because I was asking for something that plan said I could do. Think of the cost saving that that generates. But it's just as democratic. And it therefore eliminates a huge amount of costs in the system. So first of all, we need a rule-based planning system. But again, the French or the German or, uh, planning systems, it's a, it's a reciprocal process. You have national obligations on local planning, on local communities, and local communities, their views have to be taken account in the national planning guidance. So it's a two-way process, it's legally enforceable. Whereas in this country, it's a, it's, a, it's a verbal contract which isn't worth the paper it's written on. Nobody knows. The government has the MPPF. They don't have a clue whether it's actually being followed or has any influence on what local planners do or don't do because there's no way of knowing and there's no comeback if they don't. Whereas in France, you have, a, you have a, an expectation that there's actually a conflict of interest between local people who bear the costs of development and the wider interests of the general public or the region or the country, which says we want affordable, we want more houses so they're more affordable. So you have to, you have to reconcile these interests and our system only reflects the local interest, so local people, as you were explaining, have a veto almost over mm. what happens. And it doesn't matter whether it's actually pl within the plan. I remember a wonderful case of a, a proposal to build a 17-storey block of uh, flats in, in, in near Swiss Cottage. It's but one of the few places in North London that isn't height regulated and it was perfectly within the plan, but the Hampstead Society said no, so it didn't get built. So we have a discretionary system where Half the time, if there is a plan, and only 33% of local authorities even have a plan now because uh, the present government has taken away any real uh, pressure to have a, have a plan, and they've also taken away any pressure to allow houses to be built by abolishing the affordability uh, test because it was a mutant algorithm, apparently. Um, so, so the, you know, people... You know, in Seven Oaks, in my example, you, you had made some, Seven Oaks doesn't want houses, so they don't have a plan. So if any house is built in Seven Oaks, they can blame Whitehall because it's only going to go through on an extremely expensive appeal process, it's ten years after the original uh, application, at huge cost. So why do we build crappy houses, which we do? You know, our houses are increasingly rather like cars in Cuba. They're <laughs> held together with old bits of ticky-tack and tape, and they're very, very leaky. They're obsolete because we don't build new houses. New houses are environmentally much better than old houses, which comes back to the point that came from Norfolk. The sustainability of our old housing stock mm. is appalling. Yeah. The, uh, the, the carbon footprint of our housing has increased from 13.5% of total carbon emissions in this country 30 years ago to nearly 20% now, because we don't build new, modern, energy-efficient houses. Stop there. Brilliant. Have you said everything you want to say? <laughs> Well, I think this has been an amazing evening, and uh, the topic is, is so important, and it's been wonderful to have uh, such a range of views uh, from such expert people. Um, so thank you all for coming, all of you online, um, and don't go away and do nothing. Keep agitating. <laughs> I think this is an area where public opinion could really have some influence. Uh, and it, it's just beginning to come into the political debate. So please go to it, go, go, harass your MPs about this issue, harass anybody you know, ministers, journalists, um, work on it <laughs> if you're choosing a thesis topic. I mean, this is an incredible, important issue for the well-being of, of the people of this country. Um, so please... Worry away at it like a terrier. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.